Have you ever been in a group of your peers or others, maybe co-workers or business partners, and uh, everybody has this peer pressure of doing something, but you know there's something wrong with the plan. Maybe it's an integrity issue, maybe it's just not the best plan, whatever it is, but because the group kind of outnumbers you, you end up going along with the crowd. Well, today we're going to see an example of that kind of thinking. And how that kind of thinking can lead us into a sinful life if we're not careful. How group think can lead us into behavior that we never would have done on our own. Sometimes our peers need to be gotten away from us. Sometimes our peers are what can drag a person's soul, very soul, into the pit of hell if we're not careful. So today I want to talk about, obviously, Paul. But he's, there's a lot of repetition going on in what we're saying because he's telling his story over and over again. In fact, this is like the third or fourth time he's told his testimony. So I'm not going to repeat and belabor the fact of how he was saved. But I do want to belabor the point of the opportunities presented to those around him and how they responded. In the context of today, we are seeing that a guy named Felix and a guy named Festus, a little confusing with the F names there, but they're wanting to show the Jews a pleasure, or a favor, if you will. So Felix, in the last verse of chapter 23, leaves Paul in jail for two years. Two years he's imprisoned because they couldn't find anything wrong with him, and they didn't want to put him to death. There was nothing that he could be put to death for. So they just put him in two years to try to satisfy, to do a favor for the Jews. And so here we are today. After that two years, Festus is no longer going to be governor of the area, but a guy named Festus replaces him. Felix was also hoping that Paul might bribe him in some way with money so that he could be released. But either way, it was a political move to try to keep the peace among the Jews and among the, the province. After two years, Felix is replaced by Portius Festus, who now, the Jews think, they have a second opportunity to try to kill Paul. So let's go ahead and pray as we get into the text. Um, I don't think I'm going to read the whole text, because it is, uh, I'm going to try to get through two chapters, and so bear with me, but uh, we'll try to hit the important parts. Father God, would you help us in our weakness, help us to understand what we're reading, help us understand what we're going over today, so that your word has the power to save. Your word has the power to change lives. Your word shows us uh, the, the lives of Christians before us and the trials that they had. And so, Lord, the trials that we have could be encouraged because of their past experiences, because of what you've done with Paul life. The story continues, and it continues 2,000 years later into today. And so, Lord, as we carry your gospel message, help us to be as faithful as Paul was to proclaim your gospel, not only to... Um, maybe people in our, on our way about our day throughout the maybe at the grocery store or at the gas station but Lord even to political figures let us not be intimidated by somebody's Hollywood appeal or, or their, um, their status in the community Lord I pray that you would help us to be able to get the gospel even to those people that would seem to be out of touch, out of reach politically even they need to hear the gospel and so, Lord, I hope and pray that you would use this message to make us aware that you're concerned from top to bottom, every soul in our community. And so, Lord, would you help us to have a heart like yours, help us to see the heart that you've given Paul and, and the mission you've given him. You've also given us a mission, each one of us, to proclaim your gospel where we're at and where you're going to bring us. So we pray all this in Jesus' name. Why is this message is important today? <clears throat> we have political leaders that we think, or maybe we don't know, how to share the gospel with them. Maybe you have, you know, some council member of the, you know, city council or something living in your neighborhood, and you would never think to go knock on their door and introduce yourself, say, hey, uh, I'm your neighbor, I want, I want to invite you to church. Or, hey, I'm your neighbor, have you ever gotten saved? You know, Jesus is alive, did you know this? I mean, what would you say 
to somebody. Um, sometimes people have a different mindset when they're talking to somebody who has some kind of status or political <coughs> clout. Should we treat them any different, though? Maybe with respect, but in sharing the gospel, we need to give them the gospel just the same. In the first five verses, we see the assassination attempt once again when Festus is replaced, uh, replaces Felix, yeah, replaces Felix in the uh, area of Caesarea. He immediately goes to Jerusalem to try to figure out what's going on with the Jews. So first day in office, he's going to Jerusalem. He's trying to figure out what's, what's all this conflict about. How do we restore peace? And so he consorts with the uh, leaders of Jerusalem, the high priests, and the others, and they try to persuade him, bring Paul back down here, and we'll try him here. But on the way, we'll have a plot laying in wait to kill him. Like, they literally tell him this. Like, and you won't have to deal with it. Your hands will be wiped clean. It'll just, you know, be an easy way to wipe your hands from the whole deal. But in verse 4, Festus answered that Paul should be kept at Caesarea, and that he himself would shortly depart. And ten days later, he departed back to Caesarea. And he said, if anybody wants to accuse Paul, then they should come up here, and we'll have a ready trial. So, in verse 6, they go ahead and they, they have him, uh, they bring their accusations, they present their, their Paul's wrongdoing, supposedly, and uh, he's sitting on the judgment seat, and he commanded Paul to be brought, they hear all the complaints. And in verse 7 it says, The Jews which came down from Jerusalem stood round about and laid many and grievous complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. While he answered for himself, so they have a fair system of judgment where the person can defend themselves, and just like we do, if a person wants to give a defense. So Paul, of course, gives a defense. He says, Neither against the law of the Jews, neither against the temple, nor against Caesar have I offended anything at all but Festus. Willing to do a Jews a pleasure, answered Paul and said, Wilt thou go up to Jerusalem? See, even Festus is convincing him, Well, maybe you need to go back down to Jerusalem and be tried there, and we'll let you go, since you've done nothing wrong, right? But then <coughs> said Paul, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat, where I ought to be judged. To the Jews I have done no wrong, as you very well know. And so then... Knowing that he's already been tried in Jerusalem, he's been brought up to Caesarea, he's been brought back and forth, he finally appeals to Caesar. He appeals to the high court, the supreme court, if you will. But ultimately, that's going to be the Caesar, the, the ultimate, uh, the emperor in this case. The ultimate judge of the Roman Empire. So because of the absence of proof, you know, we have, we have some people we can think of because there was absence of proof. They didn't have enough proof to convict. O.J. Simpson comes to mind. You know what they say, if the glove doesn't fit, you must acquit, right? Well, for Paul's situation, there wasn't enough proof for him to be convicted of anything worth death. And so, unfortunately, sometimes in our day and age, bad people do get away with, good, with uh, bad things because there wasn't enough proof. I just got off that jury case um, back in October where it was a murder case, there really wasn't enough evidence to convict the guy. And sad to say, he may have done it, but there just wasn't enough proof. So how could we convict a possibly innocent man? Anyway, they determined to go ahead and send him up there. There wasn't enough proof to convict him of death, Paul. And uh, so they, they uh, in the meantime, he's appealing to Caesar, he knows the, uh, the Festus guy and Felix. They both know that Herod is about to... This is Herod II, by the way. I want to make a clarification and talk about him for a second. But Herod II, Herod Agrippa II, is coming down to uh, congratulate him on his new uh, position in the province as the uh, you know, Festus. So, when he's coming down, he's like, well, maybe I should appeal to Herod and get his opinion. Because whenever I send him to the Caesar, I'm going to have to have some sort of report to give him why we have this guy in chains. Why do we have Paul in chains? I don't know. He's not worthy of death, but he's got to say something. So he, he knows that Herod has much more knowledge about the Jewish background, the Jewish heritage, and the laws and customs, 
And so he wants to get his opinion. This is not a trial. This is not uh, something that's necessary. It's not to exonerate Paul. But here he is. Herod's going to come in with all the pomp and circumstance. And they're going to hear Paul's testimony once again. How many times does Paul have to share his testimony? Well, you can look at it one way or another. Anyway, let me talk about Herod just to give you the context of who he is and why this is important. Herod Agrippa II. This guy is the son. If you remember, back in uh, Acts 12, I believe it was, Agrippa I was the one that killed James, arrested Peter, and he made an untimely death being consumed by worms after failing to give God glory back in Acts chapter 12. You were here for that message. He literally died on the spot being consumed with worms. How horrible of a death when he's just boasting about, you know, the people are shouting, oh, he has the voice of a god. And he's like, yep, sure do. You know, failing to give God the glory for whatever he was saying. That was his dad. That was this guy's dad. So Agrippa I was that guy. This is Agrippa II that they're, that's coming about. And then Herod Agrippa II's great uncle, Herod Antipas, was mentioned many times in the Gospels as the ruler who executed John the Baptist. He sought Jesus' life in Luke 13, and later tried him in Luke chapter 23. And then we also have Herod Agrippa II's great-grandfather, who was Herod the Great. So we have a couple different... Guys, might not be a good name to name your kids, Herod. Not a real good guy in the Bible. But Herod the Great was the guy who ruled at the time of Jesus' birth. In Matthew 2, Luke 1. And he's the guy who murdered the children of Bethlehem in an effort to kill the newborn Messiah. So Herod has a lineage of not nice guys. Who was also there was a lady named Bernice. It was his half-sister. So in verse 13 it says, After certain days, King Agrippa and Bernice. You don't hear too much about her, but I want to give you a little bit of context of who she is. It says that they came unto Caesarea to salute Festus. So the purpose is to salute, to give honor, to uh, congratulate him on his uh, new uh, position. But Bernice is an interesting figure in history. She was not only uh, Herod Agrippa II's uh, consort, but also his half-sister. This incestuous relationship was the point of gossip in Rome. She would occasionally leave her brother and lover for another man. So this would make great TV today, right? He had been, uh, she had been the mistress of Emperor Vespian and later Vespian's son, Titus. And I believe Titus was uh, also important in the persecution of Christians, if I'm not mistaken. She always, throughout her life, returned to her brother. They were very close. She's also the strongest symbol of Agrippa's vice. Bernice was there with Herod. So to know some of the context of their backgrounds, Herod's lineage of animosity against Christians, Bernice's uh, history with relationships, you can imagine why John the Baptist was beheaded by his, uh, what his uncle, his great uncle, and uh, the other Christians... Because they weren't living a moral lifestyle, and Christians were probably calling them out on it. When you preach righteousness to somebody living in sin, they're not going to be your friend. When you call people out with their sinful life, you, you know they might feel like you're calling them names. You know, But you call them out as loving as you can, showing them scripture, and really it's going to be between them and God. Paul was... Despite the situation, he was being treated fairly, and he was giving, being given an opportunity to give a defense of his situation. The reason for that meeting in this chapter is that Festus needed Agrippa's help to come up with a reason, a valid charge against Paul for his report to the emperor. You know, sometimes um, courts take a long time to get all their data together, to get all their stuff, and even after a couple of years of getting all of their charges in order, they still can't convict a person. That's just because there may be lack of evidence. Festus needed Agrippa's help. Agrippa, then, at this situation, requests to hear Paul himself. So he gives his explanation. He gives um, 
In fact, in verse 22, it says, Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would also like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, he said, thou shalt hear him. So in verse 23 is the next day. And they come, it says, with great pomp and circumstance. And uh, not the song, but imagine the Romans are geared up in all their finest uniforms. You can imagine all the movies, all the, the when they're all dressed up, that's probably what they were wearing. They're probably blasting music. It says the place of hearing was where they went with the chief captains and principal men of the city. At Festus' commandment, Paul was brought forth. In verse 24, it says, And Festus said, King Agrippa, and all the men which were here present with us, ye see this man about whom all the multitude of the Jews have dealt with me, both at Jerusalem and also here, crying that he ought not live any longer. And then he gives the reason why he's here. He says, I found that he had committed nothing worthy of death, and that he himself had appealed to Augustus, the Caesar, as I, I had determined to send him. So he's already determined to send him. What's the point of this meeting? He says in verse 26, of whom I have no certain thing to write unto my Lord. Well, he's got nothing to write to Caesar. Wherefore, I have brought him before, before you, and especially before thee, O King Agrippa, that after examination had, I might have somewhat to write. For it seems to me unreasonable to send a prisoner, and not withal to signify the crimes laid against him. Then we have the commencement of Paul's testimony. It says in, verse, in chapter 26, verse 1, Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. And Paul stretched forth his hand and answered for himself. I'm going to stop right there for a second. Paul is given an opportunity to speak. You know, this inquiry was probably not necessary for he had already appealed to Caesar, to the emperor. But he would, it was a great opportunity for Paul to preach the gospel to a large crowd of political dignitaries. All, it says all the choice men of the city. Um, there were probably Roman soldiers there. There was all kinds of people there. Probably hundreds of people there. Ready to hear Paul's testimony. It's a great opportunity for Paul to preach the gospel to the, a large crowd of the most influential people in power. And Paul did not need Herod to exonerate him, but Paul was preaching to have Herod exonerated potentially of his sins in hopes that he would believe on Christ. Could you imagine being in Paul's situation? He doesn't need to be exonerated. He doesn't mind that he's in chains. He's preaching the gospel. And so here he gives a defense. And he tells the whole story from when he was uh, on the road to Damascus all the way through when he got saved and he's been given the gospel to bring to the Gentiles. The culmination of Paul's testimony comes up in verse 19. He's telling his whole history and he says, Wherefore, O King Agrippa, he makes a direct appeal to the king at the end of his testimony. He says, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. But God told me what something to do and I'm being obedient in line with it. He said in verse 20, But show first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles, and they that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. For these causes the Jews came, caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Verse 22, Having therefore obtained the help of God, I continued this day, Witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. That Christ, here's the gospel, that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead. That's the big controversy. And should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. And as he thus spake for himself, Festus interrupts him. He, he says with a loud voice, Festus, Paul... Thou art beside thyself, much learning doth make thee mad. And we're not talking about mad like anger, we're talking about mad like crazy. But in verse 25, Paul re retorts, he gives a response, he said, I'm not mad, the most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things, before whom I also speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in a corner, hidden. Verse 27, King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. There's a direct appeal 
to somebody with a Hebrew background that might have some inclination to get saved. And in verse 28 he says, Then Agrippa said unto me, Paul, thou persuadest me to be a Christian? And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am, except these bonds, except the chains that he's in. And when he had said thus, spoken, the king rose up, and the governor, and Bernice, and they that sat with them. And when they were gone aside, they talked between themselves. They talked among themselves, saying, This man doeth nothing wrong, or worthy of death, rather, or of bonds. Then said Agrippa unto Festus, This man might have been set at liberty if he had not appealed unto Caesar. It's kind of like the last salt in the wound <laughs> before he gets sent to Caesar. So, there's the end of the chapter. We've just read through two chapters, if you didn't realize. And we've still got quite a bit of time left. But there's the story, you know. we got Herod, Agrippa, the second, Bernice, we got Festus, Felix, they're all there together. And all the leadership of the area. They're, they just heard the gospel. Here King Agrippa even has the opportunity to get saved. Paul is making a direct appeal to them. Today is the day of salvation. Don't let it go by. How many times does somebody have to hear the gospel before they get saved? I've heard numbers, you know, that it's this number or that number. It could just be once, though. Somebody hears the gospel once and they get saved. The consequences of Paul's testimony that we know of did not result in Herod's salvation. But this is the last Herod we ever know of in history, as far as that lineage of kings. So what's the, the point of today's message? Who's influencing you? When we have all these political leaders, they're worried about perception, they're worried about you know, their, their own stance, they're worried about how things look. They're worried about their position, their power. They don't want to be considered crazy. And we don't have an emperor of Rome becoming a Christian until Christianity is really widespread. Because being in the minority, people get scared. People don't want to stand out because they're more concerned with how they look. They're more concerned with how others treat them, how others perceive them. We don't want to be looked at as a weirdo, but sometimes being a Christian will make us look like a weirdo to the world, because Christ, preaching Christ is foolishness to them that perish, them that are perishing. And so we need to have a loving compassion when they treat us like that, when they mistreat us, that they don't know because they're lost. If we're mistreated, it's not because they know better. There's a famous... Uh, guy with a doctoral degree that, uh, in the doctoral degrees in theology, who uh, preaches against all kinds of the miracles and preaches about the historical Jesus. Well, let me tell you something. If you didn't know, the historical Jesus is not the historical Jesus of the Bible. The, Bible, the Jesus of the Bible is not the supposed historical Jesus. This historical Jesus is a key phrase in uh, theological circles to refer to a Jesus that they try to think is beneath the surface. It's the hidden Jesus that... Underneath all the miracles and things that people added, I'm sorry, people added stuff? No, they didn't. But they're trying to get down beneath the surface to the supposed Jesus that they're making up, that minus all the miracles, minus the resurrection, minus heaven and hell. So what is trustworthy about this book at that point, and why do you have a doctoral degree in theology if you don't believe 90% of the stuff that's written? Just because they have a PhD, just because they have a doctoral, does not mean that we should be listening to them. And people are bringing this guy into their churches, people are bringing him into their sanctuaries, letting him speak on this garbage. Why? You got a PhD, I guess. People think that there's something that they don't want to believe, the words that are clear on the page. They want to make an excuse for their sin, ultimately. They want to make an excuse for their sinful living. I'm sorry, but if your sinful living is keeping you from just simple childlike faith, 
then the Bible is not the problem. The problem is your sin. And it's much easier for someone to uh, get rid of the Bible out of their life or godly influences out of their life than to repent from their sinful living. So if you're a Christian, you should be constantly repenting from your sinful life. If you're a Christian, if you believed on Christ, you could squander that. You could just continue to sin, even though you believe. People do it all the time. They believe on Christ. They know He's the Messiah. Look at Lucifer. Demons believe and tremble. So what about us? What makes us different? The example that we have in Herod of his opportunity to believe but then allowing his sinful lifestyle to have an influence on him pulled him right back out of that possibility to believe. And so when you're talking to people, we need to talk about righteousness. We need to talk about that sinful lifestyle because if they're continuing to live in it, people are stuck in it. It's, they're addicted. Sinful living is fun. There's a reason they do it. It may kill a pain. It may sober. It may... Uh, you know, uh, blind their, their eyes to, to the, the, the trouble that they're feeling. It may soften the depression they're feeling. But sin ultimately is like a scorpion that will ultimately win. It will ultimately kill in the end. We need to warn people about the urgency of the gospel. The urgency of the gospel is not just that we need to love people, but we need to love people out of hell. You know, if we, What did Jesus save people from if we didn't have hell? Hell kind of comes with the message. And there's lots of people who want to just eliminate that part of it because it's not fun to talk about. But if there is no hell, what are we saving people from? What is, why did Jesus die on the cross? So that we can have a happy life? So that we can be a guilt-free Christian? When we die, we don't just go into nothingness. There is a judgment to come. There is a resurrection. And so if that's true, if you believe that, are you living according to that? If you believe that we are sinful creation, are you living daily praying that your sinful side won't wake up and take over? Are you praying the death of your flesh so that Christ might live in you? We have an enemy, and he's very real. Jesus showed it in Peter, when he was talking to Peter, and he even called Peter Satan. If Jesus had to fast 40 days, what are we doing to discipline our flesh? What are we doing to discipline our bodies? To restrain evil? Are we killing it? Anyway... There's a lot that could be said. Look, Herod and Bernice, together they were keeping each other from obeying the gospel. And there may be friends in our lives that keep us from the gospel. I know when I was a new believer, um, I wanted to tell all my friends. I wanted to go back to my friends and be like, hey, you you got to understand this. This is real. Jesus really did die. He wasn't just a, you know imaginary guy. He wasn't just something people wrote about and made it up. This was a real dude. No offense. But he was a real person. He really did resurrect. And if these people were willing to die for that fact, I should too. And all I got was criticism. And my friends didn't come along for the journey, ultimately. Now, they may be somewhere in the journey now. I don't know. But I couldn't continue to hang out with them and continue to grow in my faith. There were certain people I had to cut ties with because no longer were we in the same family. No longer were we going in the same direction. I needed to surround myself with godly people. I needed soil that was good. I couldn't keep planting myself in a desert and expect to grow. And when we continue to surround ourselves with sinful people, doing sinful things, although they may claim to know Christ, claim to be doing good things, claim to be saved, you look at their fruit. You'll know them by their fruit. Who we hang out with is a good indicator 
how we're doing spiritually. Yes, we need to be in the world, but not of it. Yes, we need to have an influence on people that are not living godly lives. But when that interaction steps back into our life and starts having an influence on us, it's time for us to step back. It's time to go back to whoever our mentor was. Who's mentoring you? Everybody needs a mentor and a mentee. So who are you being mentored by? And who are you mentoring? We all need that influence. And especially as Christians, you need to be thinking upwardly and downwardly. We need, as a church, if we're not doing that, if we're not coming together, we're not going to grow. You know, If something's not reproducing then it's not growing. It's going to die. And a tree that stops producing fruit, you know, ultimately you're going to have to cut it down, right? Well, God cuts down trees too that aren't producing fruit. So we need to start showing some fruit if we're not already. And if we are, continue to show them producing fruit and God will multiply that. So there's a lot of things in our church that uh, I don't want to belabor the fact, but there's a lot of opportunities to serve. There's a lot of things that need to be done. And I don't want to lay out a long list, but some of us know what they are, and uh, we just need to do it. Some of us don't have a clue what they are, but let me tell you, once we start making a list, it can get kind of overwhelming. There's a lot of stuff that we need to do, and so we probably need to make a list. We need to think about, strategically, what do we need to do to reach people for Christ? Because there's some things, there's some tasks that we get caught up in that have nothing to do with people getting saved or not. Vacuuming the floor is an important task, and it does have an important impact on, uh, you know, perception. And but the more important things are reaching people with the gospel, planning for things like outreach events. How are we going to reach the people in the apartment complex right down the road? Um, are we going to be able to do something with them? Are we going to be able to have some sort of carnival down there and, and work with management and put up something? Are we going to be able to have the worship team? play down there? Is it going to work with everybody's schedule? Or, or, you know, what are these things that we want to do? What do you guys have? And how can we connect you and your ideas and your resources to making these things happen? There's lots that needs to be done. And this year is going to pass us before we know it if we don't get involved and, and jump on board and, and get these things done. VBS, like I said, is right around the corner. Um, spring is here. we got spring break in, what, two weeks? I think it's going to be here in two weeks if I'm not mistaken. It's going to be summer before we know it. So, I just want to encourage you. There's lots that needs to be done. Uh, I can't do it all. I know you can't do it all. But together, we can do a lot. There's a lot of service opportunities. And maybe it's not just you. Maybe you're not able to. But maybe you know somebody that can. Maybe you know somebody that's capable. We need their help too. We need people that maybe aren't sitting here today to help. And that's why we need people to reach out. Those that are not here and... Uh, See what's going on with their life. Love on them. Maybe they just need somebody to give them a call. Maybe they need you to share the love of Christ. One more time. So next week we should be finishing up the book of Acts. And then uh, we'll be off to something else. Maybe we'll take a break from going through books of the Bible like that. Just to give you something a little, a little different, a little more fresh. And... Uh, so we prayed about that. And, uh, so do we have a closing song with the worship team? I want to invite you guys, if you have a decision to make for the Lord, then now is the time to do it. Today is the day. God says today is the day of salvation. Don't wait for tomorrow. Um, so would you come forward? Would you come up? Would you make that decision or take that stand for Christ? And... Uh, Stay with me.